Okay, so let's actually look at some images, which is what we'll be doing in all the other lectures. But this short lecture will be a bit different from most lectures, because as I said, we're actually not going to look at that many artists in this course. That gives us the time to go into depth with the ones we do look at. You know, increasingly, as the more years that I teach, I've become less worried about coverage, you know, trying to cover lots of stuff. You never cover everything, you know. It's more important that we, we, we enjoy and make a satisfactory treatment of what we do, do deal with. You know, the, in education, the process is more important than the, the content in some sense. So um, we'll go fairly slowly. We'll go organically at what pace seems the right pace rather than have a set lecture each week on a different topic. Things will spill over from one week to the next, depending on where we've reached. So this will be different from that. This I'll just throw a whole bunch of images at you very quickly without going into depth about them. So this will have a different flavor and maybe a slightly disorientating flavor. Um, so what I'm doing is just give you background and introduction. So. An odd thing will be that most of what I talk about will be artists who won't be part of the course because I'm talking about what led up to the time period that we're going to focus on. I'll be looking a little bit at Impressionism uh, uh, because in many of the post-Impressionist artists we looked at themselves went through Impressionism at a certain phase of their work or at least they were reacting against Impressionism. And I'll also go a little bit further back at the very beginning to look at art of the Renaissance tradition because um, vision in crisis. These are artists who in some sense are rejecting or critiquing the whole Renaissance tradition. So I've gone all the way back. You, you have a, a slide list. This is the main ha handout that I give each week. It's just a list of the artists and works that are discussed. I have a kind of minimal handout policy uh, again, it fits in with this idea that the lectures aren't the course. The lectures are just one possible input into your uh, engagement with the, the art. So Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin, 1504. I think one thing you could say about the Renaissance tradition is that it's painting and vision are representing what can be seen, even to the point that you have an illusion uh, the space of the painting is a sort of continuation of our space. Now, or, or that a lot of Renaissance, art, art of the Renaissance tradition, it looks like almost like a window to another world, which is a continuity with our world. Illusionism, realism. Now, one of the key tools, which was a discovery of the Renaissance, is one point perspective. You know, Raphael uses that to give a strong illusion of, as if space is continuing into the world of the painting. Uh, he has other tools for making this event seem real. For example, having people in the painting, or oh, I'll use this, people in the painting looking out at us, meeting our gaze. That creates a sense of the illusion of continuity between their world and ours. Um, well, that's a main thing about realistic or illusionistic style. The Renaissance was the era that really saw painting become palpably real in that way. Realism profoundly advances during the course of the Renaissance. Why? Uh, well, this is religious art. It's to art in the function of, of religion, trying to make you feel as if you are there present at this religious event, as if you were there when the Virgin Mary was being married. Actually, the first thing is to make you believe that that marriage actually happened, you know, to make you believe in the religious event. You know, I remember once having an, a first year undergraduate student wrote me an essay, you know, uh, Giotto paints the crucifixion just like he saw it, you know, as if Giotto was there at the crucifixion uh, because he painted it so realistically that the student had the feeling that this is an eyewitness account. Uh, so that sense of as if we're there, we could almost touch it. You know, we're in the presence of the holy. That's what the artwork is trying to do. That's the reason behind 
the the realism in this case. Or j jumping ahead wildly to the 17th century to the Dutch artist Vermeer, his view of Delft. Again, you know, you have a very in detailed realism. Even the individual sort of tiles on the roof, you have a sense of, of, of that. Uh, great detail, the different kind of stone used for different buildings or whatever. You, you have immense sense of detail. Um, so all part of the Renaissance tradition. Here you, you have less of a, a kind of embodied sense of engagement with the world of the painting. He's not relying so much on perspective, but he's relying on uh, richness of detail. Now, I, I would say you could, you could critique that and say, well, that's a kind of illusion. Just because there's a lot of detail in the story doesn't mean that it's a true story. Um, truthfulness may be different from realism. Realism could be just the style, you know. Like um, a common strategy for, you know, if a criminal has been caught and they're being interviewed by, a police, by the police, what were you doing on that evening? A common strategy, you know, say you have two criminals caught and they interview them separately, of course. A common strategy is they will agree in advance what we'll say we were doing that evening is we won't just make it up. We will give an account of uh, what we did the evening before or something like that. So when the police ask, OK, so you're at home having dinner. What did you have for dinner? And they can say, well, it was pizza. Oh, yeah. What kind of pizza? You know, and they can both give the same answer because they're describing something that, that, uh, that uh, they did on a different day. So what I'm saying is that the, 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 the detail of information creates a sense of truthfulness, but that may not be, that may, may be completely untrue. There may never have been a Virgin Mary. You know, there may, she may never have got married. Um, so then Delft does exist. It's even there today. You can go to that city today. But whether this was how it looked to Vermeer, we don't know. It's a rhetoric of truthfulness. Um, he paints it in such a way that you're not aware of the brush strokes themselves. You're not aware of it as a painted object. You see Delft rather than just seeing a painting. Uh, you're not aware of the means. You're, you're aware of what that, those means are used to represent. Uh, so he, by, by not if you could see the brush stroke, you'd be thinking about an artist in his studio painting one brushstroke after another. You'd be aware of the time of the making of the artwork. Uh, but you, you aren't. You see through the painting to what the painting represents. That's, that's a trick of that style of painting, which we, we call realistic. But artists of the period we're looking at start to see this as, as indeed a, a kind of trick that maybe you don't want to, uh, to follow. That truthfulness and realism may actually not be the same thing at all. Certainly it's an illusion that we are there in Delft at that moment. You know, as if time was abolished. That's the kind of illusion we're, we're being given. Of course, at that point in history, uh, not just art, but science was also very interested in accurate recording of the specific appearance of things and so forth. You know, the big tools for science in the 17th century are the telescope and the microscope. It's about vision is at the forefront of science as well as of art. Detailed description of what you see on the surface of the moon or what you see when you look through a microscope. Visual particularity is at the important for science at that moment. But just as modern art is less concerned with trusting visual appearance, so modern science has moved beyond, you know, you know that scientists talk about things, physicists talk about subatomic particles that even in principle the human eye couldn't see. 19th century academic art, Bouguereau, The Birth of Venus from 1879. You know, nowadays when we look at art of that, that period, uh, French artists, nowadays when we look at art of that period, the artists that we 
tend to value the artists that are in the art history textbooks. This course doesn't have a textbook, by the way. Art uh, of that period, um, we value things like uh, the realists, the impressionists, the post-impressionists, including the artists we're going to be studying on this course. But at that time, the artists that were most valued were artists like Bouguereau. These were the, the artists teaching in the academy uh, and uh, the artists who had their work shown on the walls of the salon, the most prestigious exhibitions of the time. So this was establishment art of that time. Um, it's worth remembering that, you know, here we are, we are studying in an academy ourselves, in an educational institution, you know, that the institution is telling you what is the most valuable knowledge to have. Actually, sometimes that turns out to be wrong. You know, the education that these artists were getting at that time turns out to be, with the hindsight of history, to be not what was where it was going on. You know, think about that. You know, you know, this is partly why I'm pushing everything back onto you as students. You know, it's what is important is what you think, and developing your own perspective, not what you are told in the classroom. Actually, that may not be that may turn out historically to be a lot of uh, irrelevant stuff or, you know, out of, out of date thinking. Uh, don't let yourself be formed by a, an academy because the artists who were Bouguereau students, uh, if they, uh, to the extent they allowed that to happen, uh, were making a mistake perhaps. Um, well, the skills of, uh, again, the skills in realistic representation are important. You know, the, the but actually, although it appears very realistic, there's a lot of idealization, the idealization of female beauty, for instance. And a lot of the skills are actually not skills of observation. Uh, it's actually using skills of perspective. Spe perspective is not something to do with ob observation. It's to do with, um, it's a sort of s mathematical idea. Also skills of understanding of an anatomy and you know, artists like to emphasize these things like perspective and anatomy study because these were intellectual skills and that helps to raise their status uh, even in the 18th century artists were thought of as often a little bit like tradesmen you know like a constable one of the great English painters of the 19th century even he had to paint an insign you know that's just a tradesman's task uh, because you know, he had to do it. So emphasizing those skills are important. That's how you uh, elevate your, 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 the importance of your profession. Color is less important. If you look at this painting, you know, it's basically, if you saw a black and white reproduction of this painting instead of the color image we have here, you'd still basically get the idea, you know, because it's thought through more in terms of tonality lights and darks when the artist structured the image he structured it very carefully in terms of balancing lights and darks he hasn't thought much about color he wasn't even trained much to think about color color was not really theorized that's why and color is associated with emotion and uh, superficial pleasures and so forth now this is something that really changes with the artists that we'll be focusing on, Van Gogh, Gauguin, colour is central to what they do, and Matisse and the Fauves, colour is central to what they do. So the very thing that is kind of repressed or regarded as unimportant becomes the thing that is of, of great centrality. When you're making, the whole process of making a painting, uh, colour wasn't what you were thinking about, how would you start? You start by painting a ground and the ground would be a middle tone, a sort of grey or brown middle tone and that helps you because it helps you to balance your lights and darks. You then paint down to your darks and up to your lights. Uh, that helps you balance. But when you get to Impressionism they would paint a white ground that would create greater luminosity in their images. Colours could be, could be brighter. They weren't concerned with thinking of their images in light and dark balance. You know. So this is uh, ways in which Impressionism and then Post-Impressionism breaks with an existing tradition. 
all these figures would have been studied from models in a studio. Okay, the scene appears to be out of doors, but it's artificial. That's a that's a lie that the painting is telling. You know, it actually, that's not how the image was made. Um, the artist has great skill, say, at certain things like representing human flesh. That's uh, anatomy and human flesh is something you have to study in great detail how to do. Perhaps a little bit less successful at representing water. It seems kind of artificial the way, you know, the. the figures are sort of sitting on water as if it's some, something kind of hard that you could kind of rest on. It doesn't seem quite right. A lot of the art of this period, it's not very good at representing the relationship between figures and their environment. That is a big breakthrough with Impressionism and you'll see it also in later artists like Cezanne and also Picasso. The concern for the whole surface as one and thinking about integrating the figures with their setting. You know, the impressionists start to work out of doors rather than working in a studio, get natural light effects rather than carefully controlled studio light effects. This is how art is studied in the 19th century. In a studio, they're modeled from a figure. Uh, the light would be a northern light. So that's a sort of midday light, so it's a sort of steady light. Uh, they, they, even the way they're sitting with a model on that side and the students on this side is so that the light doesn't uh, cast a shadow of a hand over their, where they're trying to work. If you imagine if they, they were the other way around, that could happen. That would be a bit irritating. So, yeah, light was very controlled, artificial. It seems realistic, but uh, it's not. Um, the painting is an artificial construct of different figures put together that you studied separately and you learnt when you were a student. You didn't learn by copying from nature. You, you learnt, first of all, by copying drawings. Uh, then you copy from plaster casts after sculptures. Then you copy from live figures, static live figures. Then you start to make a painting. Uh, gradually, over time, you start to develop your, your skills. Uh, sorry, I only have black and white images here. This is the final painting. Again, it's by Bouguereau. And this is blown up as if it were the same size, although it's actually much smaller. A sketch for that painting. Now, uh, although the final paintings were very realistic at that time, very detailed, uh, it took ages to produce a large uh, painting of that kind. So you probably planned out your composition uh, on a smaller scale uh, in a more sketchy way. Uh, a funny thing happens, you know, this is your ideal to be in great detail, but most of the time you're, you're making sketches. So the working process undermines the the values that the system is supposed to espouse. Uh, so what happens with Impressionism, they, they sort of take the aesthetic of the sketch and they elevate that to the end result. They say, well, this is okay, we can, we can stay with this. We actually like the informality of touch. It's more spontaneous. That fits the mood of our time more. These things look kind of rigid and stiff and we, we, don't, we don't need that. Courbet, uh, the, the most important artist of realism. Realism is the first major rejection of academic art and its value system. Courbet is also painting the nude, female nude, a central subject of academic art in 19th century France. But it's just, it's not a mythological painting. This nude is not Venus uh, as Bouguereau's was. It's just a real actual woman. So already that's kind of a bit shocking. Uh, she's also not uh, idealized in her proportion. In modern terms you say airbrushed or photoshopped to have a perfect figure. She, she's uh, in a more sort of real life proportion uh, that some, an actual woman might look like or something like that. And perhaps even more radical than that two things. One is she's turned her back to us. Uh, the Bouguereau's uh, Birth of Venus 
uh, the, the, the female nude is making herself available to the gaze of the viewer. The viewer is assumed as male, and the male gaze is allowed to be a sort of ero eroticized appropriation of the subject of the painting. Uh, Corbet already is starting to realize there's something a bit dodgy about all that. So uh, the most shocking thing perhaps about his painting is that the, it's a female nude, but she's not available to the, the spectator's gaze, turned away from us. Actually, her pose still looks a little bit artificial, like the pose of a, of a mythological nude in the many paintings of the time. It doesn't look that natural. It isn't that Corbet is more realistic in a sim than more truthful in a simplistic sense than uh, existing art. Uh, he's referring to the untruthfulness of that art. He's laying bare the untruthfulness of that art somehow by showing its conventions. Maybe you, you have even more of a sense of the disjunction between the figure and the setting. And the figure is obviously being posed in a studio, even though it's shown in a natural setting, the light on the figure looks different from the, the light on the setting. Somehow it, there's something odd about that. You know, artists of the Impressionist generation, the next generation, really start to see this as an issue they have to deal with. We've got to kind of integrate the light in the painting, the figures with their setting. How do we do that? We do it by going outdoors, painting out of doors, instead of working in the studio. Figures painting, history painting was the most storytelling painting, was the most central painting uh, of the academic tradition. But with Impressionism, landscape painting, landscape becomes more important. Landscape had been a relatively minor genre. Suddenly it becomes a really central genre. And we see that in the artists too of the period we look at. You know, we see Van Gogh, for instance, or Cezanne. Landscape is really central to their output as artists. So the fact that she's turned away from us, even walking away from us, she's not available to us. Another Courbet painting. Um, yeah, instead of painting mythological scenes, he starts to paint real everyday modern life in all its complexity. Hard, physical, dehumanizing labor. You know, remember the people who are looking at this are the the bourgeoisie in Paris, you know, not other poor people in the countryside. Stone breaking, you know, imagine if that was your job day after day, breaking stones down into smaller stones to make a surface of a road. It's a totally dehumanizing kind of tough physical labor. You can see uh, the way he's represented their uh, tattered clothing, that these are people from the poorer strata of society. But he's made careful decisions about how to represent. You know, it's not enough to say, just paint it more realistic and that will be better. Um, no, you have to always make ch choices as an artist of how to represent. You may not let your viewer realize that that's the case, but uh, you have to. Uh, for instance, uh, Courbet's made an important choice to turn the heads away from us. In one case, it's partly that the head is in shadow more than the shadow of the hat hiding the features a little bit rather than the head being completely turned away. But by doing that, he's, as it were, saying to us, oh, yeah, their world is not your world. Don't think you can just em empathize with their life. Your life is not like that. I'm not going to give you some easy satisfaction that you can say, oh, look how philanthropic I am. I, I, you know, I empathize with the poor. Uh, stone breakers. No, you're not allowed such an easy way out, you know. Just to give you a sense of some of the choices that Courbet's made in that painting, uh, here are a couple of other paintings from the same time period of the same rather specific, you know, rare theme, stone breaking, uh, both by a British artist. This is Wallace. In this case, the stonebreaker has died, I think, because of his uh, exertions. Uh, but that's not altogether clear, but it seems to be the case. Uh, but somehow the way he's treated the landscape setting 
it's much more emotive. We here we are allowed to emotively identify and sympathize. You know, it's more about our feeling than about his suffering, even though he's arguably worse off than Courbet Stonebreaker. And also the landscape, we're allowed to sort of escape into the mood of the, the background. Courbet doesn't give us anywhere we can escape to. This is even more light in tone by Brett, another English artist. Uh, playful little uh, motif of the dog, lovely little dog playing with the boy's hat. He's just a boy. It doesn't seem like hard work, you know. There's nothing dehumanizing about this. Just tapping away a little bit at some stones. And again, the landscape we're allowed uh, to escape into the landscape. So my point is about there are choices about representation. Uh, realism can, because of its rhetoric of truthfulness, it can try to persuade you this is the only this is the way it was but no the artist made all sorts of choices reality can never be all completely captured in the painting uh, in the artwork so that's a kind of recognition that the artists we'll be talking about started to have they, they started to look at these images and see the the fake fake nature of it all somehow and it was not satisfying to them they want you to look at a painting and be aware you're looking at a painting, not thinking that you're just getting reality. Manet is another important breakthrough artist. Um, one thing, I, I won't say too much, but uh, one thing that is breaking down here is the notion of narrative. Narrative is still there. Something is going on, but we don't actually know. We can't refer back to mythology or history, something that pre-exists the painting to explain it as we can with the Bouguereau birth of Venus, we just refer to pre-existing mythological knowledge. Two men and two women in a woods, some that's a contemporary scene, she doesn't have her clothes on, what is going on, we don't quite know, we can guess, but we, you know, there's narrative, but narrative is sort of broken down. And, that the light is even more artificial, flattening frontal light. It's so artificial, we're aware of the artificiality of it. We, we start to see the thing as a two-dimensional design, not just a representation of an illusory world, such as Raphael gave us. Um, or Manet also engaged with this theme of the nude that, that Courbet had already attacked. Manet you know, put another nail in its coffin, this key theme of the 19th century art. Um, the nude here looks back, but in a confrontational rather than welcoming way to the spectator's gaze, the male gaze. Your, the spectator is made self-conscious of their um, approach to the image. Um, and uh, more than that, uh, the, the, you know, she's not in a position of being subservient, she's actually raised up, she's actually potentially a little bit dominant over the spectator. Well, actually it's more complex than that, but we don't have time to go into it. But, but the spectator is doubled, you're the spectator of a painting, but you're also constructed as the visitor to a prostitute, you know. So the, the, the sexuality of the spectator's gaze is sort of brought out into the open rather than, you know, the Bouguereau painting, you could critique it as like a sort of soft pornography in a way, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a respectable painting. You're not, uh, that issue doesn't come up in reality because uh, uh, it, it, it just seemed, oh, it's mythology. That's, uh, that's um, all respectable and fine. But Manet's painting is somehow bringing out into the open things that were, uh, kept hidden. You know, he's, he's referring back to old master paintings, specific to this Titian painting. So the echo between his painting, it's a cat, not a dog, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, this will all help us to see that tradition is being questioned, even as it's being evoked. Impressionism. So Impressionism, Monet. So here we are, an artist who's concerned to paint out of doors rather than indoors no artificial light. So light itself in the real landscape, suddenly he has to deal with that. 
the style of the painting is much more broken. You're aware you're looking at a painting, you're looking at marks on the surface. The flatness, the two-dimensionality. That's partly because of the nature of the subject. It's, it's got a much better representation of water than Bouguereau did. Uh, but to, in order to achieve that, he has to create this sort of broken brushwork that draws your attention to the means of painting itself. So Impressionism, it's, it's almost like the, the most extreme version of realism, but at the same time the unraveling of realism, or the, the realist project starts to not quite work anymore. Um, whereas realism is concerned with the uh, rural life and often the, the life of the peasantry, Impressionism is often concerned with middle class life and the life of leisure. Leisure, not work. Middle class, not the, uh, the poor. So the, the middle class are both the subject of the painting, you know, their, their leisure, they go boating, they go swimming, they just wander around the river bank, or they, they, they go along this place here and eventually it leads to a restaurant on a little island. Um, but somehow the whole style of painting is more the same kind of informal, leisured way of looking at things. It's not so s structured, and it's more all-over, comprehensive thinking. The light is uh, unified. There's no figures belong in their setting. They're not. They don't stand out awkwardly. It's actually a sort of strangely dehumanizing vision in a way, the Impressionist vision. Everything in the image gets the same amount of attention. A, a passing reflection on the water surface is just as important as a human figure. So one, one thing we see with, say, Van Gogh is a, a, a move beyond that to, you know, boundaries start to become important again for him. Figures really are, need to stand out. A tree even needs to stand out from its setting. He wants particularity, not uh, a blur of uh, holistic kind of feel, which you get with Impressionism. By looking at modern life landscape, one thing that happens is that huh, Monet has to deal with the complexity of modern life landscape in a modern capitalist society. So what happens? Uh, well, industry happens, pollution happens, hard work happens. So how, do, how does Monet deal with that? Well, he, in a work like this, he starts to deal with it. But after a very short period of time, he kind of gives up on dealing with the complexities of modern life. And he seeks a sort of escape back more towards nature. You know, paintings like this where there is not so much modern life. So the big point I'm trying to make here is that the Impressionist artists themselves also had a kind of crisis of vision in the 1980s. It's not just Van Gogh and Gauguin and Cézanne who had that crisis of vision in the 18, 1880s. So a work like this by Monet is much more about subjective expression of mood, you know, expressive expression rather than description. Uh, certainly that's there in Van Gogh but it's here also in Monet. It's a, it, the tempestuous sea becomes a sort of metaphor for the artist's feeling or our feeling. It's all a sort of late romantic vision, you could say. One of the factors in all this is the influence of other cultures and their way of seeing the world. You know, artists of Impressionist and post-Impressionist period were very aware of other uh, cultures and partic uh, the particular one they were aware of was Japan the Japanese uh, uh, art as expressed especially through the Japanese print. This is a Monet painting with the Japanese subject. It's pretty trivial in a sense uh, but um, it becomes a big issue. You know, Even this image is related to certain Japanese prints. Um, you know, the very late work of Monet becomes almost abstract you could say. A similar kind of crisis of vision comes with Renoir, one of the great founders of Impressionism. Again, here is uh, he's painting out of doors. There are many figures, but the figures are integrated in their setting, modern life. Nowadays, the Impressionist vision is is 
greatly admired, but when people first saw a painting like this by Renoir, the critics couldn't get it. You know, they looked at it and they say, God, her skin, it looks like it's rotting, you know, bruised and rotting, it's terrible, you know. Today we, we see our oh, oh, lovely dappled light and the integration of the figure and the setting and all that. It shows how much what we consider realist uh, depends on our expectation. Uh, impressionism has come to teach us to think that the world is like this, you know. How artists represent the world influences how we think about the world, how we see the world, and therefore what we consider realism to be. You know, there, there, there is, you know, Picasso will say, say that, you know, that uh, you, I'm trying to convince you of the truthfulness of my lies. Renoir also has this moment where he loses faith with Impressionism, has a kind of crisis with Impressionism. So in the 1880s and afterwards, he starts to produce work like this, which in a way, look, it's almost a sort of going back to uh, classicism, academic art, and it's concerned with the nude and with sharp boundaries between the figures and their setting, and concerned with smoother touch. Very, very different from, from, from this approach to the, the nude in nature as a theme. So all, all of the major impressionists, well, Pizarro, Monet, Renoir have that kind of moment of crisis themselves about Impressionism. Well, that's really all I have time to say. So I'll just show you briefly a work by each of the main artists we're going to look at. The first one we'll look at starting next week is Van Gogh. So he goes through Impressionism but moves on to something different. Working from nature but also He's not concerned just to describe the world. There's much more to the, that art can do than just give you accurate images of what one city in Holland called Delft looked like at that moment in time. Uh, maybe there's, maybe it's more important to tell you what his feelings were at that time because maybe that could be of interest to you and the feelings you have and dealing with your emotion, emotional life. You can't describe emotions the way you can describe. Uh, a townscape, you know, realism won't help you much there. So expressive roles of art and colour it plays a central role in that. Same with Gauguin, colour is central, but maybe arguably more expre more decorative than expressive. Again, like Van Gogh, you're getting a sense of two-dimensional design, pattern in two dimensions. It's a mile away from, miles away from uh, Raphael's illusion of a world that is a continuity with our world. You're aware that this is something artificial, a two-dimensional surface that has to be arranged and composed as a two-dimensional surface. Cezanne, less concerned directly with colour, perhaps more concerned with form. We'll explain more about that later. Matisse in the 20th century continues those coloristic interests of Van Gogh and Gauguin and Picasso and Braque, his collaborator, continue the interest of form uh, of Cezanne. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm aware that's an incredibly rushed introduction, uh, but as I say, the pace will change very much next week.